you'll hear me better. Got it stored in a new place tonight. All right, now, welcome, welcome to everybody. Glad to see you here. Start this evening kind of like it did this morning, Sam. We're glad to have the Fox family, but we've got the extended Fox family tonight with the Morrisons as well. Welcome to all of you and everybody else who's able to come this evening. Great to have you here. Appreciate you coming back. We're going to be using as our core central text this evening, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, 16, 17, I believe it is. But it'll be a little bit before we get to that. But when we get there, uh, you'll already have it marked and, and ready to go. You know, a lot of times uh, preachers will give credit to their wife for their sermons. They'll say, I tried to preach it just like she wrote it. And I've heard a few of them talk, and I've known their wives, and I thought, Probably that's more truth than what they really wanted us to believe. I read this past week about one who said, I worked hard on this sermon. And when I thought I had it completed, I asked my wife to look it over and take out all the dull parts of it. So in conclusion, <laughs> I hope this is not one of those. <laughs> But I want us to talk this evening about, I, I call it, uh, hey, have you got a second? Have you got a moment? Have you, have you got a little time? Because we're right at the end of the year, in the beginning of new year, we think more about time right now. And I think about the, the calls I get at the office sometimes. Chris Steiner calls pretty often, and Chris, will, he, he doesn't want to impose. Give, give Chris good credit. He doesn't want to impose. And so he'll always say, do you, do you have a second? And I have to say something like, well, at my age, I'm not really sure. But uh, I, if I do, I'll spend it with you. And, and we talk a while, don't we? And then I get those phone calls once in a while. I'll get one from Alan or one of the other elders, and they say, are you busy? I am never going to sit in that office and tell an elder I'm not busy. You know, I'm going to always be busy. <laughs> Spending the time as best we can. And whenever we get right down to it, the fact is, and I think the scriptures are very, very uh, agreeable with what you and I observe as time goes on, that, that time is probably the greatest asset that we really have. It's not when it's all said and done, it's all said and done. And therefore we come to understand that it's not how much money we had, not what titles we may have attired, uh, 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 acquired, or, or what people may have used to, to speak of us in terms of, of special honors that they gave to us. It's not how fast we could run, not how neat our automobile was or how fine our house was, not how many college degrees we had, not how beautiful, not how handsome, not any of those things. When, when you get down to what's the greatest thing that we have at our disposal, it probably is time. And you wonder, why, why, why do we really see time as that important? Ben Franklin said that time is the stuff of which life is made. It's the time that we have that becomes our life. And we have no ability to extend it of our own power Jesus said we can't grow hair on our head whenever it stops growing. I, you know, they always say, would you, would you like, uh, you like a product that would help your hair to grow? And I have to say, what hair? You know, we got to have something to work with here. But time, how much time do we have? Now, there's no guarantee in what David said in Psalms, whenever he said the days of our year shall be three score and ten, and yet, if by, he says, we happen to live 80 years, four score, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, and soon we're cut off and we fly away. He's saying that after about 70, 
some patient people it's earlier than that. Life is not as much fun as it used to be because we get creaky. Uh, I read this afternoon a gentleman who's having a birthday, and he's my senior. I'm not sure how much, but he said a lot of people don't think I look as old as I really am until they hear me get up. Uh, that's kind of embarrassing sometimes too, but that's what the psalmist is saying, that there's going to be some difficulties and some tired, squeaky joints, and it won't be all fun as you get older and over, older. And so two verses later, he said, therefore, we ought to apply our hearts to wisdom. We ought to give our attention to the things that are spiritually important, the things that are spiritually important going to exist eternally, that's where we really ought to focus because we don't have a guarantee of a certain amount of time here. Well, that may be one of the reasons, don't you think, that it is so important, why it's so much what we focus on, the, the fact that we don't know how much time we have. When we're young, we think nothing can happen. And uh, then as age goes on, we realize that things could have happened. And yet a time eventually comes for some of us, but not for everybody, where we realize I've lived longer than I really expected to. I don't know if I've ever told a congregation this before, but I never did get intent when I was young. I didn't intend to get this old because I had my... My, uh, I don't know what, what to say, my engine revving, and uh, I, I really did think that I'll burn out by the time I'm 39 because I, I did work so hard and such long hours and see that there were so many things that needed to be done and I could never get them done. And uh, it didn't turn out that way, though it could have. We don't control the days of our lives, nor the time that we have. And so we don't know how much we have. There's somebody wrote a little poem that talked about the clock of time is wound but once, and no one knows when it will stop. At early evening or at morn, it may stop at any minute. And in the background, I've seen that in a video where there's a click, 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 click that's going on until it gets to the word stops and that silence. It's pretty impacting to realize that time goes on until it doesn't. And we lay plans as though there's going to be a lot of time. And it's that that James is observing in James chapter 4, 13 to 17, when he said, come now. And that's kind of like saying, come on now, we would say today. Come now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we'll go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. He said, but you, you know not what tomorrow is, you know. Who, who, who knows about tomorrow? What is your life? It is even a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. It's like a fog in the morning that covers everything and you can't see. But then as the day wears on, it lifts and it leaves no track. It lifts, leaves no furrow, no rut. It leaves no impact at all. It's like it never was there. He said, your life is like that haze. It's here, then it's gone. So he said, we ought therefore then to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and we will move and we will do this or that. He goes on to say, for him, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. We ought to use good judgment in regard to the time we have and to more especially the use of time. It's not so much the passing of time that's important to us, and it's not so much the passing of time
to which we will eventually give an accounting to the Lord. But the real question will be, how'd you spend it? How'd you use it? For what? Did, did you benefit others? Did you use it to the, the good of society, of the church, of the name of Jesus, the teaching of the word, raising a family, directing them in the right direction? What was you applying it every day? Were you applying it in a proper, important manner? Or did you, as we sometimes say, that we wasted time? We can waste it. We can't save it. I've always been amused at how people talk about, I took a shortcut because I wanted to save some time. And we did this and we saved time. If you've ever saved any time, where did you store it? You know, is there a brown bag somewhere at your house that you put your extra time into? Is there a freezer that you store it? Is there a, a lockbox in which the time that's been saved can be put? It, it, we don't save time. We either use it appropriately or we waste it. Now, that's not to say that doing some relaxing, doing some time that lets us recreate and some, some fun times and letting our body and our mind kind of chill out for a while, that's not wasted time. That's, that's reproductive, getting us ready to go on further and, and do more productively. But whenever we squander it in foolish things, it may well be that that'll be part of what we give an account for someday. That passage I referred you to, if you turn to it, I'm going to read it from this translation where Paul said, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Watch out, he's saying. Walk carefully. You likely won't remember, uh, but I assure you I do, that about, I think it was nearly two years ago, Betty and I were going one night down to the Orpheum, and I don't know what show we were going to see, what the event was, but we went early. It was this time of year when it gets dark real early, and it was not so... I, my, my vision hadn't improved to the point that it has now after all those events connected with that. And so we went early, but it still was getting dark by the time we got there. Parked at that bank that's across the street, just a half block down, got a good parking place, started toward the uh, Orpheum, and Betty was ahead. And uh, I don't know if I looked away or what it was that distracted me, but I, I needed to be watching how she walked in a good way. And, and uh, she, I, I saw her walking along the sidewalk, and I thought she got there smoothly. And so I started to follow her. The only thing was, there was about a six-inch drop from where I was walking to the sidewalk, and when I took that step as though it was going to be smooth, <sighs> just a lot of thin air. And I'm down on the ground, just banged on the concrete. And I'm lying there and she's saying, are you hurt, are you hurt, are you hurt? Is the Pope a Catholic? <laughs> yes, I'm hurt. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> but. It just hurt so bad. I, I caught on my hands, and it didn't scratch them up as much as something like that usually does, but it almost pushed my, my shoulder joints out. And I thought for a while I damaged them badly, and I've, I've had some physical therapy since then for them. And uh, that was a bad fall. Could have been worse. But when I read this verse, he's saying, walk wisely. 
walk the, the King James Version, I believe, uses the term circumspectly, not one a word that we use all that commonly as we do wisely. Walk circumspectly, making good use of the time. And he says, don't, don't walk as unwisely. I was walking unwisely that night. I wasn't watching the way clearly, and true, I, I had handicap, but still, I, I could have watched closer, and I would have learned by her stepping down that I needed to step down. I could have paid better attention. And when it comes to our spiritual lives, there's a great application here in terms of our walking wisely. Don't take foolish chances. Don't do things that, that are uh, inappropriate, that put us at risk spiritually. I may have told you before, I, but it impacted me so that I still remember it very, very clearly tonight. When I was... I don't think a senior yet, must have been a junior. I was doing my, my boxing in high school, and there was a tournament in a town about 30 miles from where I went to school. And the, the school didn't take us up there. We went on our own to the tournament. The coach was along, but he didn't provide transportation. And I wound up riding up there with uh, a guy that had a, uh, a brand new 57 model Ford and uh, he was very anxious to demonstrate to all the rest of us how fast it ran and uh, on the way back he was driving I know he was driving over 100 miles an hour down the winding road and I'm sitting over in in the passenger side in the front and we didn't have seat belts back then and going around those corners, I was being pushed over by the door, and I'm thinking, I shouldn't be here. I, I really ought to say, Coy, stop the car and let me out. I'll walk. But I also thought, these guys will be at school Monday, and they'll tell everybody what a wimp I am. And so I stayed quiet. And as you can see, it turned out okay, but it could have been a fatal accident, and we all four that were in the car could easily have been killed. And it wasn't wise to be there. Young people, I know guys do, and I suppose girls do too sometimes, put themselves into harm's way in ways like that. And Paul's talking about don't do that. But he's applying it, of course, more in a spiritual vein. Don't take chances with your soul. Don't just put yourself out there in the middle of the highway where the devil's truck is going to come and smack you, and you kind of set the thing up by being there in the first place. Therefore, he said, uh, well, verse 16, he said, making the best of the time, the King James Version says, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. There are things that will hurt you. Just like this morning, whenever Paul was telling Timothy about the things to watch for, he spoke of the silversmith back in Ephesus, and, and he's telling him, there are people out there who will hurt you. There are people out there who mean you harm. You need to watch out for them. Here he's saying to the church in Ephesus, be aware that when you do not walk circumspectly, wisely, you're putting yourself into harm's way because there are people and there are circumstances out there that are evil. And in verse 17, therefore do not be foolish. He's not calling anybody a fool, but he's saying if you do not walk wisely, then you are behaving in a foolish manner. If you're not redeeming the time, if you're not making the most of the time, if you're not using it the very best way you can, you're behaving in a foolish way. Because just like you can't save time, you can't buy any. You can't get any back. Once it's gone, it's forever gone. And you cannot 
reach back and get it and use it later. It's, it's that one-time opportunity every moment that occurs. Therefore, he says, do not be foolish, but understand. That's a real impacting message there. Understand. He's saying, get it right now. Understand. Get this. That this is a point that is eternal. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is. The will of the Lord is that we serve Him with all our might. Paul said, whatever you do, let it all be done to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Ecclesiastes urges us whatever we find to do, we do it with all our might. And Paul there in Colossians says, do it as unto the Lord, knowing that ultimately it is he who gives the reward, not men, the praise of men, the honor, and all those accolades that they can give. They don't mean anything when it's all said and done. Understand what the will of the Lord is, and that's what we need to do in applying the time that we have. There is a, I think it's a Latin phrase, carpe diem. That means buy up the time. Make the most of it. Make the most of every moment because the time is limited. Don't be unwise. Instead, find out what the will of God is in all kinds of circumstances. Understand it, get it, and do what is most important in the coming year or whatever amount of time that we may be given. We need always. I read an article a while back that had a list of, I'd say, 15, 17 different suggestions about how to use time wisely. One that had never quite occurred to me, I thought was interesting, was something like this, that if you sleep one hour a night less, but use that in, uh, in productive ways, in the course of 10 years of one hour less per night, you gain two eight hour work weeks two years of eight-hour work weeks in a 10-year period. I don't know how important that might be to somebody, but when it comes to the application at the very best use of the time that we have, it was interesting to me. When I was probably 20 to 22, three years old, I read an account that impacted me and it was an account of something that happened with Charles Squab, who was president of U.S. Steel, right at the end of the Great Depression, somewhere around 1931 to 33, something like that. He was in that job, one of the most well-paid men in all the country. Compared to revenues today, of course, his salary wouldn't sound so much, but it was just grandiose for that time. And he wanted to have some advice about the use of time. And so he contracted with a man who was a time use specialist. And the man came in and interviewed and visited with him. And then he said, I'd like to spend a week with you and just watch what you're doing and advise you in that week. Swab said, what do you charge for a service like that? And he said, I will not set a value on it. What I'd like to do is observe you for a week, and then I'd like to give you the advice, and you use it for a while, and you decide what it was worth to you and pay me that amount. That was the day, I guess, when handshake deals were honorable, a lot different than what we might see today. And that agreement was uh, made. The fellow came and watched for a week. And among the things that he told him was to every night when you go to bed, and better still, if while you're still at the office, you can take a little time 
and think of the things that need to be accomplished the next day and write them down. But th when you have them written down, go back and place a value on each one. And the one that's most important to accomplish, that's number one, and second is the second most important, and so on, until they've all been numbered. When you come to the office the next day, you start working on number one, because that's the thing that needs most to be accomplished. And when you have finished that, move to number two. But if you do not accomplish that in one day, don't move to number two. You keep on until you accomplish that. And you do that every day. You make the first thing the first thing. You make the main thing the main thing. And you use your time that way, doing the things that count the most. And when it comes to other things that need to do, be done, delegate them to people who probably do them better than you do instead of insisting on doing everything. And so I began to use that part of the plan. And the story was that at the end of 30 days, he sent to the man, and I, I do not remember the figures now, and not remembering how little people were paid in 1930s, I, I dare not give you a precise amount, but the man received a check for something like $100,000 or a million dollars or something like that because Schwab said, this is the most valuable lesson I could conceivably ever have learned about time management. And so I share it with you free tonight. But make the first thing, the main thing, what counts. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. It is he, through the Holy Spirit, that must be inspiring, that we ought to walk wisely, not foolishly, that we ought to redeem the time, that we should understand what the will of the Lord is, and put it first in our lives. That brings us back to that concept that when we're trying to decide what is the most important thing that needs to be accomplished, it's something that's spiritual. It's something that's eternal. It's something that makes a difference not just in this life, but in the life to come. And time, time is so important to us because it's constantly running out. There's a passage in Romans 13. We know Romans 13 mostly for Paul talking about honoring those who are in authority and paying our taxes and so forth. But at the end of it, there's a paragraph beginning in verse 11 through 14 that we ought to be aware that time is passing. He said, be aware that the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Our salvation, he said, is much closer now than it was when we first became Christians. We've come this far. There ought to be something accomplished. Reminds you of the Hebrew Chapter 5, verse 12, when the writer said, When for the time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. You've wasted this time. You haven't grown. You haven't produced. You haven't become teachers. And you need to progress in that. And here he's saying, it, Our salvation, the day of judgment, and of course, there's ultimately the final judgment, but the day that our life ends is the time that our opportunity to change anything about that day also ends. And so he said, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore walk as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness and chambering and wantonness. He says, not, not in these things that are debauchery and, and sin and all those fulfillment of sexual desires and so forth. He said, those things need all to be surrendered, but seek first the will of God and, and all the things that bring glory to Jesus Christ. That's how time ought to be spent. Have you got a second? 
Have you got a moment? How much time do we have? And I don't know. It is indeed appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Maybe we'll live another 10 years or 30 or 40 or 50. Some of you will live longer. But whatever amount of time we have left is not really ours. It belongs to God. And we need to be wise. And we need to understand that we ought to use it for him. And in fact, I don't have any time. God's let me use his, but I don't have any. I don't own it. I can't control it, but I can use it. And the better I use it for his glory, the more pleased he will be when I give an accounting someday. If you're here tonight and you need to become a Christian, how long you got? How many more times will you hear an invitation? I don't know. You may say, well, uh, the time will come, and, and I'll know. And, and some people can do it that way. Next Saturday, as I said this morning, I'll be supposed to be at the Seven Points Church building down in East Texas. And there I'll be doing a memorial for my little brother. I held a meeting there at Seven Points. I'm guessing somewhere in the range of 18, 17 years ago or so. And because it was a community where he and Kay lived, they attended. I think they came Thursday night. It seems to me it started Thursday night and, and went through Sunday. But they came Thursday night, and then they came Friday night. And that church always has some kind of an eating meeting at, during their gospel meetings every night. They go off just across the wall to another room, and they eat cookies or they eat things that are more than that. And so we were on our way out of the main auditorium into that room, and at the back, Gary said, Bud, uh, when you get a moment, I, uh, I've got something I want to talk to you about. And I said, okay, let me go in here and spend a little time with the people, and then we'll come back in here. And after I'd spent some time socializing with the crowd, I said, let's go in and talk. So we walked into the back of the auditorium, and I said, what what you have on your mind? He said, well, you may or may not remember, but when I was 17 years old, you tried to convince me to be baptized. I told you I wasn't ready. But I promised you that if I ever got ready, you would be the first to know. And tonight, I'm telling you, I'm ready. And so that night, we crawled the crowd back into the big room, and we baptized Gary. His wife, Kay, was astounded and big-eyed at the whole thing, not having had any idea that he was going to be making such a change. But she came, Betty was teaching a ladies' class the next day, and she came to that class, and then she talked with Betty, and that night she was baptized. Gary was 51 years old when he was baptized. He had a long time, and he got to fulfill the way that he had in his mind that he wanted to do it. But not everybody does that. And I wouldn't want you to rely on being able to wait that long and still get to become a Christian. Or you may have drifted away from church. You need to come back. Walk wisely. It's not wise to be out there in the darkness of sin, temptation, and trial stumbling along, maybe not seeing the pitfalls that lie ahead like I didn't see the step down, down by Broadway Street. Be careful. Use the time wisely and come back. Become again faithful to the Lord. Let us pray for you. 
Let your soul be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. If you've never been baptized, accept the, the grace of God and be baptized for the remission of sins. Let the blood wash you clean while you have time. Right now, while we stand and sing, we invite you to come.